Hello everyone, welcome to my video. So first off, let me thank the organizers of the Junior Mathematician Research Archive to let me contribute this video. So my name is Charlotte Ura. I'm currently a postdoc with the University of Virginia. And in this video, I will be telling you about prime tours and the Biograph elliptic curve. So let's get started with just a couple definitions about the Brow group and some examples. So the Brow group of a field is given by Morita equivalence class of central simple algebras over that field. So an algebra over that field F is called a central simple algebra or CSA if and only if its center is that field F and has no non-trivial two-sided ideals. And then on that set, of central simple algebras, we can define an equivalence relation. Um, and so we say that two central simple algebras A and B are Morita equivalent if and only if A tensor sum, sum matrix ring MNF is isomorphic to B tensor sum matrix ring MMF. Um, and then the Brouwer group is given by the set of equivalence classes. Um, and the operation in the Brouwer group is given by the tensor product. So a classical result related to the Brouwer group is then a result due to Brouwer, Albert, Hasse, and Nota that shows that the Brouwer group of a field is actually isomorphic to the second group cohomology of F with coefficients in F bar cross. So whenever I write this um, H to F here, what I mean is this is Again, group cohomology, where the group is the absolute Galois group of the field F, and then F bar cross means the units in the algebraic closure of the field F. Now, let's go through some examples. So first off, whenever the field F is algebraically closed, every central simple algebra is isomorphic to matrices. And so in this case, the Brouwer group is just trivial. Making things a little bit more interesting, you can look, for example, at the Brouwer group of the real numbers. So in this case is one non-trivial Brouwer class, and that's the Brouwer class of the quaternion algebra. So um, you might be used to maybe a different representation of this. So if you're used to IGK, IJK, this looks somehow different to that, but it's the same thing. So the way I like to write it is H, the, the quaternions, is the free algebra over the real numbers with two generators x and y such that x squared is equal to minus one, y squared is equal to minus one, and when I want to commute them, I commute them with a minus sign. Now in my title, I was talking about the Brouwer group of an elliptic curve, so in particular I might be interested in, well, what's the Brouwer group of that associated function field? And it turns out that if the ground field k is algebraically closed, then the Brouwer group of that function field is again trivial. And that, this actually works for every algebraic curve, not just for elliptic curves. And this is due to Zen's theorem. Now, again, I'm talking about Brouwer group of elliptic curves, which really means that I have to tell you what the Brouwer group of a scheme is. So I won't go into the details too much, but basically what happens is that we generalize our definition of central simple algebras to schemes or varieties, and then they become as my algebras. So the Brouwer group of a scheme X is going to be given by Morita equivalence class of now as Maya algebras over X. And furthermore, we get a generalization of the classical result by Brouwer, Albert, Hasse, and Nusha. So if X is sufficiently nice, so for example, if it's quasi-projective, the Brouwer group of X is isomorphic to the torsion of now the second Ital cohomology group of X with coefficients in GM. And so um, what this already gives us is a motivation for wanting to study the Brouwer group because we want to understand these cohomology groups. The other motivation that I really have comes from questions of rationality. So one big theme in arithmetic geometry is what's called the Hasse principle. And in particular, the Hasse principle actually does not work for all varieties. So in 1951, Selma showed that this equation here, the equation 3x cubed plus 4y cubed plus 5z cubed equal to zero has no non-trivial solution over the rationals, but it has solutions in the real numbers and in the p-adic numbers for all primes p. And so what this means is so our, um, the Hasse-Minkowski theorem that we have for quadratic forms in this case does not work. We cannot 
somehow lift our solutions that exist locally to a global solution. And in 1971, Manin defined an obstruction to exactly this. So having a variety X, for example, we can look at certain elements lying inside the Brier group and this certain element or these certain elements describe an obstruction to exactly the existence of rational points or to this lifting prop to this lifting of solutions. And this again gives us a really good reason for wanting to know what exactly do elements inside of the Brier group look like. Another avenue of rationality comes from the Leroux problem. So this problem is asking, is every unirational variety rational? And this is true in image one and two, which was proved by Lerot and Castelnuvo in 1876 and 1893. And at that point, really people believed that yes, this should be true. And it took almost a hundred years to come up with counter examples. So in dimension three, this is not true. And there were two constructions, one due to Arden and Mumford and one due to Clemens and Griffith, both, both published in 1972. Um, and these constructions used the Brouwer group, or explicitly used elements in the Brouwer groups. Um, yeah, they explicitly used elements in the Brouwer group to come up with these examples of varieties that are unirational but not rational. And so this should already really give you a feeling of why we want to know what, what elements inside of the Brouwer group look like. And that gives me my main objective for this talk. So what we want to do is we want to start with the field K and E is any elliptic curve over that field K. And we want to describe the Brouwer group of E as explicit as possible. And I should mention here that I really want my field K to be kind of as far away from being algebraically close as possible. And the reason for that is that, well, we saw in the first slide that the Brouwer group of KE, where K is algebraically closed, is trivial. And as we will see in a second, the Brouwer group of E actually lies inside of the Brouwer group of K. And so it's not an interesting problem to study if the base field is algebraically closed. Now, what's going to help us along the way of making this description explicit or of even saying, what do we mean by explicit here? So the first thing that we should notice is that the Brouwer group of an elliptic curve is actually a torsion abelian group. And this is just by virtue of its definition. Well, you can either think of, of that theorem that I had that it's really the torsion of the second etal cohomology. Um, and so it's gonna be always a torsion abelian group from there. Um, the second thing is that the Brouwer group of E is naturally isomorphic to then ramified part of the Brouwer group of the function field. And so what this means is that instead of thinking of as Maya algebras over my elliptic curve, I can really think of just central simple algebras over the function field. And these are usually a lot easier to handle, a lot easier to describe. And one big reason for why this is so much easier is the Mercurius-Susslin theorem. So this one connects what's called the second Milner group and the Brouwer group. And so one, um, well, a consequence of this theorem is the following. So if K actually contains a primitive D3 of unity omega, and let's say D does not divide the characteristic of K. And I want to describe now the D torsion of the Brouwer group of my field. So what the mercury susslin theorem says is that every element in the D torsion of the Brouwer group of KE can actually be written as a tensor product of symbol algebras. And the symbol algebra is really just a generalization of quaternions. So the symbol algebra, for example, of A comma B, where A and B are elements in my field, is the free algebra over that field with two generators X and Y, such that X to the D is A, Y to the D is B. And when I want to commute them, I, I stick in my D third of unity here. And remember from the first slide, when I wrote the Hamilton quaternions um, as the free algebra over R with two generators X and Y, such that X squared is minus one, Y squared is minus one, X times Y is negative Y X. So using all of this, my main objective now becomes the following. So what I want to do is I want to describe generators and relations of the detours of Brouwer group of E in terms of tensor products of symbol algebras over that function field K. And now luckily for me, when I started this, some of the work was already done. 
So one thing that was already done was the two tours. So Chernyshev and Guyetsky in 2001 described generators and relations in the two torsion of Virgo of E over any base field of characteristic different from two. Um, and so we already know now what the two torsion is, what about higher, higher torsion? So putting in an extra assumption that we will see is very natural later on. Um, Skorobogatov and later Chernyshev, Rapinchuk and Rapinchuk described generators of the detorsion. So the assumption they made is that the detorsion of the elliptic curve is actually k-rational. And we will again see later, one, why this is natural, and also why it is actually a really big assumption to make for the base field. Now, my work started after that. So using that same assumption that the detorsion of E is k-rational, I added a description of relations of the detorsion of Bergop of E. And furthermore, when D is actually an odd prime number, I was able to describe generators and relations of the q-torsion of the Bergop of E over any field of characteristic different from 2, 3, and q, containing a primitive q through of unity. And so let me maybe say a little bit about these assumptions that I'm making that the characteristic being different from two or three really stems from the fact that elliptic curves just look slightly different in characteristic two and three. Um, I do believe that a lot of the results should still work. Um, and then not characteristic Q and containing a primitive Q root of unity that comes from the fact that I want to use the Mercury of Suslin theorem, and I want to be able to really write down my generative relations in terms of these simple algebras. And to even um, use my, the way I write down my simple algebras, I need my primitive Q thread of unity in my base field. So again, this is the result. There is an algorithm to commute these generators and relations. Um, however, the, the algorithm is still a lot of work sometimes to actually go through in particular examples. Um, one very interesting consequence of my algorithm is actually an upper bound on the symbol length inside of the bra group. So um, I wrote this result below here. So the Q torsion of the bra group decomposes as the Q torsion of bra group of E of K, excuse me, plus I. And every element in I can actually be written as a tensor product of at most two times Q minus one times Q plus one symbol algebras over the function field KE. And let me just mention here that I do believe that this, this bound here is very far from optimal. Um, and it should really be possible to bring this bound down. In particular, in explicit examples, we can definitely bring it down already. Um, I haven't been able yet to bring it down in the general case, however. So let's look a little bit now into what kind of theory goes actually into all of this, into the algorithm, and how could we just go about describing um, elements in the Brow group of E in terms of these symbol algebras. So the main ingredient really comes from the hochschild serre spectral sequence. So that's a spectral sequence that I have up top here. And its sequence of low degree terms is the sequence zero into the Brow group of K to the Brow group of E to H1 K E K bar to zero. And so if we want to describe this thing in the middle there, that D torsion of the Brow group of E, what I really need to do is I need to describe a split here on the right, because we can assume at least for, for our base field being nice enough that we know what the bra group of that field is. Furthermore, this thing here on the right is at least easier to describe than elements in the bra group, um, because, well, this is an H2, this is an H1, so it should be easier to write down. However, the issue still is that this map here on the right, it's a map from H2 to H1 coming from the spectral sequence. So it's going to be fairly complicated to write down even what this map does to a specific element inside of the Brow group. And it's going to be even more complicated to come up with a split directly. And so the thing that's going to help us is multiplication by D. So multiplication by D on the elliptic curve looks like this, or on the, I should say on the um, K bar rational points of the elliptic curves. So M here is just the D torsion of E K bar. And if I apply now group cohomology to this, where the group is the absolute Galois group of my field K, then I get this sequence on the right. So I get zero into E K modulo D E K into H1 K M, where again M is my D torsion. And then into the same quotient that my sequence from before had to zero. 
And now instead of describing a split here in the bottom, I can just describe a map here. This map epsilon is all I really need. Um, and of course I need a specific map. I need a map that actually would induce a split in the bottom. And so once I have this, I know that now the detorsion of brow group of E decomposes as the detorsion of the brow group of K plus some I, where the generators of I now come from the image of my epsilon here. And the relations come from this composition. So the composition of first I do delta, then I do epsilon. And now luckily for me, such a map was already described in theory by Skorobogatov. Um, and the hard part now is to make this map explicit. And I should say here, why is this the hard part? The reason for that is that the map is given as an Ital cup product. And Ital cup products usually are not very explicit, just kind of by virtue of their definition. And so it's a very difficult problem to make Ital cup products into real um, hands-on explicit maps. So let's see now what this map does in somewhat the easier case and why this assumption to make MK rational, my detours in K rational, why that is really a natural assumption to make here. So if we assume M is K rational, then we have two generators P and Q of it. And so M is really isomorphic to Z mod DZ cross Z mod DZ over K as a, as a, as a K module. And so in this case, my H1 here, by Kummer theory is isomorphic to K cross mod K cross to the D, cross K cross mod K cross to the D. And so now my map epsilon, what it does is it takes an A comma B to the tensor product of two symbols, and the tensor product is A comma TP, tensor B comma TQ, where TP and TQ are just two certain fixed elements inside of the function field KE. And so now I know that my generators at least are given by these two things, the A comma TP tensor B comma TQ. And my, my relations are the ones coming from here and then I can set them down by, with delta and over with epsilon. So let's see how this all works in an example. So let's say our K, our base field is Q joint omega where omega is primitive third root of unity. And let's say E is the elliptic curve, Y squared equals to X cubed plus 16. And what we want to compute now is we want to compute the three torsion of the Brouwer group of that elliptic curve. Now, in this case, my three torsion is K rational. We are in the nicer case. And it's going to be generated by these two points. So the point P is the point 0, 4, and the point Q is the point negative 4, 4 square root of 3i, which again, this is K rational because I have omega, my third root of unity, added to my field Q. And now in this case, my three torsion of the bar group of E decomposes as the three torsion of the bar group of K plus I. And every element in I can be written as a tensor product, A comma Y minus four tensor B comma Y minus this guy here um, for some A and B in K cross. And so here, I do want you to notice, so the, this first part here comes from the P, the second part here comes from the Q. And then we can also write down the relations here um, so an element in I is trivial if and only if it is similar to an element in the subgroup generated by these two things here. So this is again with the assumption that my three torsion or my Q torsion is K rational. Let's see what we would do if it's not rational. So the thing to consider is the Galois representation associated with my elliptic curve. So I have this map here from the absolute Galois group of K into the automorphism group of the torsion. And so if I fix the Galois extension L that is determined by the kernel of this Galois representation, um, then L is really the smallest Galois extension of K such that my M becomes L rational. And why is this gonna help us? This is gonna help us because now we know the description of the brow group of the Q torsion of the brow group of E over that L and somehow we have to descend it now to our K. And so note that in this case, the degree of L over K is gonna divide the order of GL2 FQ, which is just Q plus one times Q times Q minus one squared. And so there are three different methods needed to, for three different cases. So the first one is, what if the degree L over K is not divisible by Q? 
And in this case, co-restriction restriction is an isomorphism, which means that I can, I can just descend the solution that I have over, over L and can get a solution down on K. The second case is the most complicated one. So if L over K is actually equal to Q, the problem is co-restriction restriction is actually not an isomorphism anymore, so I can't use that. What I am going to use for this one is what's called the restriction inflation exact sequence. And so um, we will see this in a minute in an example how this actually plays out. But again, this is the, the more complicated case um, when the degree L over K is actually equal to Q. Now, the third case when L over K is divisible by Q, well, we just put our first two cases together and then we get a solution for that third case. So let's see in an example how that more difficult case is L over K equal to Q actually works out. So let's say our K, just as in the example before, it's still Q adjoined omega and omega is still a third root of unity. And let's say E is now this elliptic curve, the elliptic curve Y squared equals to X cubed plus four. And now in this case, the generators of the three torsion are P is equal to zero two. So this is still K rational, this one's nice. Um, but Q is the point negative two third root of two comma two I square root of three. And so this point Q here is not K rational and the smallest extension of K so that it is rational is the field K adjoint third root of two. And so that is gonna be my L that I had defined on the previous slide. And now in this case, the algorithm that is laid out in the preprint is that the three torsion of prior group of E is equal to the three torsion of prior group of K plus I. Every element in I can be written as A comma Y minus two tensor two to the J comma Y minus two square root of three I for some A and K cross and J is just any number zero, one or two. And let me mention here, since I said this all really comes from inflation restriction, um, this first part here, this here really comes from lifting uh, via the restriction. And the second part here, this comes from the inflation, um, which can be seen fairly explicitly within the algorithm itself. So that's what I wanted to say about the, the work that I've done on this so far. Um, what comes next for me is, well, first off, I would really like to extend this description, not just for the prime torsion, but I really would like to finish the description and also describe it for the prime power torsion. Now, the thing that makes this a lot more complicated is that, well, my difficult case before was when Q was equal to the degree of L over K. Now, if I want to describe, for example, the Q squared torsion of the Bragg of E, what might happen is that that L has actually degree Q squared, for example. And so that is gonna be, a little bit more complicated to handle and I'm going to need more tools for that. Um, the other thing that I would really like to do um, is that I mentioned this bound on the symbol length that I have and I would really like to sharpen this one and get a better bound on the symbol length with, with an I that I have. All right, thank you very much for listening to all of this and if you have any questions or comments please feel free to reach out to me and send me an email.